to welcome you all to our next XDX Data Safe Deep Dive. This time we are hosting the great team of the World Food Program. Um, WFP has been one of the long-standing partners, not only of OCHA, but also one of the first organizations that joined the humanitarian data exchange and also share uh, data sets on the platform. My name is Javier Teran. I work for the Center for Humanitarian Data. And in today's session, WFP will be talking about the work of the, um, uh, the economics and markets team, but also they will be doing a deep dive into the hunger maps, into the uh, hunger maps application, the global price databases, as well as the forecasting system that they handle. The session will be recorded and available soon after the end of the webinar in our YouTube channel. The chat box, as I was uh, referring before, is open. Feel free to introduce yourself, post any question as the webinar progresses. Um, the agenda for today will be the following. So we will start with an opening remarks from the head of the WSP's Economics and Markets Unit. Uh, then we will go into an overview of the work of the Center for Humanitarian Data and the presence of WFP on XDX. We will be explaining how you can access their data sets and what is available. Then we will move into an introduction of the, of the world of WFP. As I said before, with a big deep dive into the hunger map, into the uh, global food prices database, into the uh, alert for price spikes, and also on the forecasting system. And then we will have a session on a Q&A. So feel free to, uh, to drop your questions on the chat box as, uh, or, or, or comments as the webinar progresses. Um, I would like to introduce today's presenters. So, first of all, we will be starting with Frederic Greb. She's the head of the Economics and Markets Unit. Also today, as a panelist, uh, we have Valerio Giuffrida. He's a BAM officer. So BAM stands by the Vulnerability Analysis and Mapping Unit. Uh, together with Valerio, uh, Angela will be joining. Angela Di Perna, she's an economist and is also part of the same unit. Julia Martini will be also joining, joining us. He, she's a data scientist at the Hunger Monitoring Unit. And um, from the XDX team, Metasevia Salu, data manager and based in, in Nairobi, will be also guiding us on the Q&A session. Um, with that, I give the floor to Frederick for your opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Javier, and uh, welcome, everybody. So I probably don't have to tell anybody here about the importance of data for humanitarian response, because if you wouldn't be convinced by that, you probably wouldn't have dialed in. But one point that I wanted to make, that using data as an enabler for a more effective and efficient humanitarian re response, I don't think it has ever felt more urgent than, than today. Because we are, and I'm focusing on food security uh, now, as coming from the WFP, um, we are facing extremely high levels of food insecurity today. So currently we have 345 million people in the world who are acutely food insecure. So in the world, meaning in the about 80 countries where WFP operates and where we have data. And that's almost 200 million more than pre-COVID. So the pandemic was a huge um, economic shock that eroded people's incomes and purchasing power. On top of that, we've had, or we have the war in Ukraine, which led to sharp increases in prices for, on global markets for basic staple commodities. And these price increases trickled down to the local markets, further impacting people's purchasing power. And even though global prices have decreased a bit, that, that didn't trickle down um, equivalently to the local level. We have had um, exchange rates depreciate in many places. We have huge debt issues. 60% of low-income countries are currently in debt distress already or at high risk of it. And that means that 3.3 billion people live in countries that spend more on, on paying their debt service or on interest than on health or education. So in short, on the economic side, it's a really precarious situation in many countries. And economic shocks are one of the key drivers of food insecurity. 
On top of that, we have an accelerating climate crisis. So if you look at climate-related disasters, um, when you look at the average number in the 60s and 70s, we had 70 of them each year. And in the last 20 years, it was more than 300 every year. State-based um, armed conflicts have increased sharply over the last um, decade, and 70% of acutely hungry currently live in, in fragile and conflict-affected situations. And those are the three key drivers of acute food insecurity. So, um, as economic shocks, the climate crisis, and, and conflicts. And that has led to a, um, especially conflict and uh, also climate shocks have led to a sharp rise in forced displacement. Um, we surpassed the 100 million mark last year. So wherever you look, it's, it's not looking good. The drivers of acute hunger and humanitarian crisis are in full force and the, force and the trends are, tend to be going in the wrong direction. So the needs are very high and at the same time, um, we are seeing a reduction in humanitarian funding. So speaking for WFP, we have a projected operational needs for this year of more than $23 billion, and the current funding forecast stands at $10 billion. So it's, it's, rare, it's, it's extremely important to make every dollar go as far as possible, and, and data are a key enabler to do this. And then one other point that I wanted to make opening this um, webinar is the importance of linking different data sets. Um, because it's not just about having the data available, but it's also about having diverse data sets in the same place. So when I was talking about uh, food security or food insecurity, I actually was talking about economic shocks, climate shocks, conflict shocks. So food, food insecurity is an outcome. But really, we're not only looking at food consumption consumption scores or food prices when we look at or when we analyze food insecurity, but we're looking at the underlying reasons and the root causes that drive it. And so it's it's critically important to overlay different data sets, be it on conflict, climate and economics, and also to go beyond the root causes and look at what's happening in terms of access to clean water and sanitation or healthcare. Because if you don't have that, then even if you have food, your body won't be able to absorb the nutrients and energy. So, in summary, this collaboration on data is, is critically important today because of the record high needs, but um, also because of the complex interlinkages between the different needs, which mean that we need partnerships and collaboration, and especially collaboration on data. Um, over to Meti. Great. Thank you so much, Frederick, uh, for your remarks. Um, I will now move on to the next agenda item, uh, which is to give you an overview on the center, the HDX platform, and the WFP datasets hosted on it. UN OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data was established with a goal to increase the use and impact of data in the humanitarian sector. The Humanitarian Data Exchange Platform, or HDX in short, was established in 2014, and since then, we have seen growth in many dimensions. In 2022, HDX was used by 1.5 million people in 233 countries and territories. Around 1.8 million datasets were downloaded throughout the year. Currently, there are close to 300 active organizations that are sharing data on the platform. WFP has been sharing data sets on HDX since uh, 2014, and we very much value our partnership. This is a, a, a GIF from the WFP's Food Prices Datasets page on HDX. There you can find over 100 datasets covering food prices data in 98 countries and some 3,000 markets. Although many countries started reporting from 2003 or thereafter, the data for a few countries goes back as far as 1992. So with that, I will now pass it back to Frederick for the deep dive into WFP's work. Over to you. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'll briefly introduce the, the World Food Program, our division, and then what we do before I hand over to Angela and Valerio for like 
the real meat of what we are talking about today. So the World Food Program is the, the world's largest humanitarian organization and we work towards zero hunger. So main focus is saving lives in emergencies, but we also try to change lives by using food assistance to improve livelihoods, to increase human capital, to build resilience to climate shocks. And ideally that goes hand in hand, with the saving and the changing lives part. Um, next slide, please. Or even the next one. Thank you. So, and within WFP, we sit in the research assessment and monitoring division. And um, the, our vision is that we believe in the power of evidence to end hunger and malnutrition by 2030. And our mission is to provide credible, relevant, and timely evidence for strategic and operational decision-making, but also for advocacy and resource mobilization, so data-driven communication, and also for accountability to beneficiaries. As a division, we have two main functions. We have a part that is the what, what's called VAM, the vulnerability analysis and map mapping part, and then a monitoring part. And um, for the on the VAM side of things, the, um, our what we do is we provide food security and vulnerability analysis that is um, geared towards designing or informing the design of programs uh, and we deal with questions such as what's the optimal transfer modality or how do we best target those in needs and on the monitoring side it's about um, measuring the pro program performance and detecting issues and irregularities and also ensuring accountability to donors and affected um, populations. Next slide, please. So within what we call RAM, the Research Assessment and Monitoring Division, we have different services or streams of work. Um, the first one here on, shown on the left is Needs Assessment and Targeting. And I guess what it is is already in the name. We, it's about assessing needs or generating the, the evidence uh, on who needs assistance most and then um, doing the targeting. In 2022, we supported or we did uh, 140 assessments and we are a major data provider for the IPC or the HNOs. Then we have the hunger monitoring unit and that's where Julia works. And um, the hunger monitoring unit provides um, remote real-time monitoring and that's available through the hunger map live. It covers 80 countries and it also offers um, a suit of actionable products like daily reports and analyses at global, regional, or national levels. We have um, a climate and earth observation unit, and um, there we basically use satellite data or long time um, or long climate records to detect and map the impact of climate hazards um, on conflict, on displacement, and on then livelihood resources and food security. And um, with these data, we support WFP's programs, and that can include um, resilient as resilience assets monitoring or index insurances or anticipatory action programs. So, for example, one service that we provide is the it's called AIMS, the Asset Impact Monitoring from Space, where we, in 2022, monitored more than 1,000 WFP assets. Field monitoring, um, that's the, the, the what I before talked about as the monitoring part of our division, so the idea here is to gather the data to, to measure the outcomes of WFP assistance and the, the team supports in three broad areas. It's um, on developing measurement frameworks and methodologies, guidances and tools and capacity building. And one um, achievement to highlight from 2022 would be the um, development of the WFP corporate results framework that allows to measure progress against WFP strategic plan. And lastly, we have the economic and market analysis um, unit. That's um, Valerio, Angela and me. And um, over to the next slide, please. So within our unit, we have um, different streams of work. So we monitor global trends and um, or the global economic context and then analyze the food security implica implications of global economic shocks. We also have a platform for or have developed uh, a platform for economic simulations called SHAPES, um, the shock and assistance platform for economy-wide simulations. And these 
um, simulations help us answer questions about like, what would be the food security implications of a certain shock, be it an economic shock or a climate shock, and what's the impact of WFP assistance in the local economy. As we, so we, we, with these models, we can, with this platform, we can estimate things such a, as a multiplier effect of cash assistance. We also work on market assessments, and here um, that's mainly about the market functionality index tool. Um, which is um, it's a nimble tool that comes with an uh, assessment tool for markets and it comes with an end-to-end -end data pipeline that provides results within a day or 24 hours from, from data collection. And it's used in, in uh, nearly 70 countries and 4,300 marketplaces is our coverage at the moment. We work on essential needs um, analysis. That's a more holistic way of looking at, um, at food security, acknowledging that um, poor or vulnerable people often have competing needs. So um, they're not only concerned about their, their, their food needs, but they also have other essential needs that they have to um, take care of. And you really have to look at all of them jointly in order to design effective programs. So here we are involved in in establishing so-called minimum expenditure baskets and um, support on transfer value setting. Um, and at, towards the bottom of the slide, we get to what we are talking about today. So we um, we collect market prices, we monitor um, prices and um, calculate or give price alerts. Um, uh, and um, when I talk about prices, it's really a bit broader. So it's prices for basic staple foods, but also some other essential goods and what we mentioned here on the slides, also exchange rates. And going across all the, these different areas of work is our work on information management, and that is about the design of solutions that optimize the use of the data that we collect, and it involves such things as standardization, database management, data storage and sharing, and uh, visualization. And with this, over to Valerio. Thank you, Frederica. Uh, so the um, start uh, of the collection of the market prices at WFP is uh, actually rooted in the origins of the vulnerability assessment and uh, mapping uh, um, unit that was the origin of our division. Uh, with this um, exercise, uh, basically, uh, we started collecting information on the price of uh, various commodities uh, around the world. And if you can move to the next slide, we can see a bit better visually the coverage that we have nowadays. Uh, so um, this is basically the result of a work that started in 2009, uh, when our division was in originally funded and uh, where the issues of the global crisis basically started to unfold into uh, the uh, spikes of prices of commodities that are the basis of the diet of many households in the world, of many families around the world. Um, one of the aspects that uh, then WFP started to cover with this data collection was the uh, aspect of the access to food, specifically looking at the economic assets, that is one of the key pillars of the food security analysis. Um, the evolution of prices uh, then becomes one of the uh, aspects that we need to look into when we consider um, how households are able to um, procure the food that they need to uh, to consume from markets, uh, given most of the households are dependent from, from markets for procuring their goods. Uh, with this, then, uh, thanks to the broad uh, network that uh, Frederike highlighted of um, analysts that we have around the world, uh, and thanks to this uh, presence of WFP in many countries, we were able to put together the information that uh, you can see and access now on, uh, on HDX, uh, and on our corporate platforms. Um, with this, uh, we are able to, to monitor the prices, uh, to look at the evolution that these have, and uh, uh, how the, in uh, specific locations uh, uh, we can see uh, if, uh, again, the households are able to, to purchase these goods. Um, moving to the next slide, please. 
So the, the coverage that I was mentioning looks not only at uh, then a national level, like the, the one that is usually reported in, in many of the data products that you can find uh, in the world from, from various other institutions, but it looks at the local level. For this reason, we have more than 2,000 markets on which we have uh, active uh, market price monitoring uh, coming from, uh, from WFP or from uh, secondary data collected by other agencies. But uh, again, thanks to our presence and our privileged access to national statistical institutions, we are able to put this information together, covering uh, 500 commodities around the world, so covering uh, uh, not only the food items uh, that are most consumed uh, in a country, but also some of the non-food items uh, and some of the nutrition com nutritious commodities that instead are important whenever uh, um, an organization like WFP needs to implement the, uh, some programs. Once again, the, the, um, these uh, prices uh, need to be monitored continuously with an high frequency and in particular uh, need to be uh, reported uh, in a timely manner so that uh, whoever takes decision always has uh, the latest information available and accessible. Uh, related to the accessibility, we pushed really a lot to have this information public, publicly accessible. And uh, again, thanks to the collaboration with HDX, this was possible uh, now already a long time ago from 2014. Um, this database that we put together then uh, has been used in a number of cases that we will uh, analyze uh, in the, in, during this presentation. Uh, but uh, the, what we can see, for example, in the next slide is uh, um, an analysis that was performed uh, to observe the, the uh, the difference uh, between uh, the prices uh, of cereals uh, in uh, local markets uh, against the national level uh, consumer price index data. Uh, through this analysis, we started exploring uh, uh, something uh, similar to the, um, to the inequality studies that are conducted by the World Bank uh, uh, and that look at how uh, inequality exists not only between the various countries, but also within countries. And for this reason, the uh, accessibility of very granular information that is extremely localized, that is extremely tied to specific commodities, becomes very important because the decisions that are made by, uh, by the, the organization and during the implementation of programs don't happen necessarily at the national level, but typically are uh, deeply rooted in the context uh, in which operations happen. So the assistance happens, for example, in the case of WFP at, com uh, at community level, really. So in this way, we, with this information, we are able to connect the uh, level at which uh, programming is done and the level at which uh, the information becomes available and uh, the decisions are, uh, can be made. Um, in, in this case, we can see, again, with this difference between the national and the local prices, how there are uh, variations that can com be comprised in a, range the, uh, in a range between uh, minus 15 and plus 13 percent, which means that the allocation of resources made by a program officer when defining uh, a program activity can be much better optimized with this kind of granular information. And this is just one of the several use cases in which market prices are effectively used uh, in WFP within the organization, but that can be used also by other organizations that conduct a similar uh, type of uh, humanitarian assistance, not necessarily only for food, but also for other needs that are uh, important for, for the most vulnerable households. Um, with this, I think I end over, if you can put the next slide, please. Uh, so um, another use case is uh, the one of, uh, of the Alps, uh, the Alert for Price Spikes, um, that is uh, used to identify uh, cases in which the prices are moving too, um, too quickly. 
let's say, so that when increases uh, in prices uh, are much higher than the expectations uh, that we build through this uh, model. It, uh, this indicator uh, helps us identifying uh, uh, the level, um, the situations in which prices are unusually high, uh, go above uh, this, uh, this expected trend and uh, remain consistently above this, uh, this expected trend. Uh, through this, uh, uh, we can identify those cases in which uh, uh, we need to, for, to adjust our decisions, uh, in, again, in the local context. And uh, we need to then inform the, um, the food security analysis that is performed at local level. So understanding what is the level of food insecurity and the capacity of households to, uh, assess, uh, to have access to the goods from the markets. Uh, it allows decision makers uh, to, to take decisions on how food security is evolving and how uh, higher prices might be uh, causing um, deprivation at, uh, for, for the vulnerable families that don't, don't have a high economic capacity. And uh, um, in, case in, which, uh, in cases in which the procurement happens at local level, we are also able to provide that information that is useful to, to supply commodities locally to, or to procure commodities locally, uh, meaning that whenever there is a market that uh, shows uh, signs of uh, very high prices, uh, then the supply routes might have to adjust to, um, to make sure that, uh, let's say, the traders can take advantage of the markup that is uh, uh, generated by this high price, uh, but also the humanitarian organization don't further uh, demand goods from these markets, so don't procure go goods for this market. In these cases, uh, then a rebalancing of the supply routes happens uh, and the decisions are taken in a much more informed way and in a timely manner, thanks to the, to the visually uh, easily interpretable um, solution that is provided by the alert for price spikes. Um, this, again, uh, these are only a few of the use cases and the indicators that can be built uh, on top of uh, an information like the alert for price spikes and for which we, we really encourage uh, to, to perform additional research uh, uh, on the data that is uh, accessible from, from the various sites. Uh, please, Angela. Okay. Thank you, Valerio. Um, okay, so I think we have uh, seen what are the like a bit an overview of the uh, price database and uh, the alert for price spikes. And uh, Valerio already started mentioning uh, the use cases and all the let's say um, the possibilities that uh, the this database offers uh, to. I think within our organization, we have mentioned already that we use it to inform our programs uh, and our emergencies, and then uh, it's also used a lot for advocacy and communication. Uh, here on the slide, you have a list of uh, internal, uh, um, a number of, uh, let's say, uh, systems that um, are informed by the price database, for example, the corporate uh, alert system that uh, let's say, it raises the attention uh, in uh, countries uh, where um, uh, assistance, where, you know, as, uh, there is a surge in the needs. Uh, and then we have, uh, for example, um, some advocacy tools, uh, such as counting the beans, the cost of the food baskets, or simply our uh, tweets. Um, and um, let's say now um, we would like to focus on uh, two of uh, the use cases that we have highlighted on this slide, the market monitor and the hunger map live in more detail. So over please to the next slide. The first one uh, that I'd like to present is, um, so that, as I was saying, the market monitor. Um, the, it is a bulletin uh, published uh, and updated every month where we try to summarize all the wealth of information that we have uh, uh, in the price database and the updates uh, that we get on prices every month. You see just a glimpse of it um, from the screenshot that you see on the slide, but the bulletin can be explored uh, fully online on the Economic Explorer data visualized platform that is uh, publicly available. 
In fact, it is not a static bulletin, but it is more an interactive dashboard where you can explore key insights on a number of points. First, uh, you can explore trends in stable food prices and their impact on the cost uh, of uh, food baskets. Basically, what we do is that we try to, we take uh, all our prices, we select in each country the most important, uh, let's say, commodities, and um, we observe the trends uh, in the cost of these, uh, in the price of the, uh, these items. Then uh, we construct baskets, very simple baskets, uh, um, a basket for each country um, that is constructed uh, in a very simple way. Just uh, it's a simple basket that ensures uh, 2,100 an intake of 2,100 calories per day. Uh, composed on commodities that are mostly consumed locally. These commodities are, are weighted according to what we call, let's say, the calorie contribution. That is the amount of calories that each item contributes um, to the daily caloric intake of a person in the local con context in the country. And the data for this is derived from the FAO food balance sheet. And then we take basically the prices and these uh, baskets to observe uh, how the cost of acquiring these basic, um, basic foods evolves over time. In addition to that, uh, we display, let's say, a summary of the alerts that are raised uh, by the alert for price spikes indicator, for example, uh, showcasing the number of uh, markets that show an alert or crisis uh, um, in a specific country and highlighting which are the commodities that uh, are in uh, uh, crisis uh, or alert status according to the indicator in each market. Uh, furthermore, we summarize, for example, uh, information on uh, both headline and food inflation worldwide and on currencies movements, um, as well as um, evolution on, let's say, global, uh, food, uh, global markets and international uh, food commodity prices. Another use case is the hunger map live that is WFP global hunger monitoring system. It's a system that is based on continuous uh, remote data collection of uh, food security indicators um, that are used together with uh, other secondary information, uh, allowing to assess, to monitor, and to predict uh, the magnitude and severity of hunger in real near, near time. Um, the platform covers all the countries where WFP has operations, but also most lower and lower middle income countries. Um, you can see a map on the slide in blue. Um, yeah, still on this slide, thank you. Um, in blue, you see the countries where the real-time monitoring uh, is in place, um, 41 countries, and then you see some countries in orange where um, real-time monitoring is uh, not in place, and so where a now casting system that uses only secondary data is used to um, estimate trends in food security. Over to the next slide, please. So as I was saying, um, in these countries, the hunger monitoring team uh, relies um, on um, data that are related to key drivers of food insecurity. Uh, this include um, um, uh, data on weather conditions and agricultural production that uh, are maintained by uh, the climate unit of WFP. Then um, uh, conflict data are also used, in particular this uh, number of uh, conflict-related uh, uh, fatalities uh, from AGLET, publicly available repository of uh, conflict events. And finally, um, our economics and markets uh, data that includes uh, the price data and in particular the uh, alert for price spikes indicator. In addition to other economic data such as, uh, as I was saying, like food and headline inflation, exchange rate movement, and GDP. Next slide, please. Um, this, um, all these data are processed. Uh, using a machine learning algorithm that is called XGBoost. And uh, this allows to estimate the current level of uh, insufficient food consumption in the countries where primary data is not available. 
this, uh, this is then made available uh, directly on the Hunger My Client website. This uh, now casting methodology has proven uh, very effectively in uh, trying to predict uh, uh, food security. And so the team has uh, also been working on expanding the scope of this work and has moved uh, to also forecasting uh, food security levels. So with the same data that include uh, the uh, remote monitoring data, as well as the secondary data just presented, um, but using a different algorithm that is called the reservoir computing, um, the, the team is able to forecast uh, for the security levels. And this is currently only piloted in four countries, so it's still a bit work in progress, but that we hope that can be, it's very promising work that we hope can be um, also made available uh, soon. And I think with that, um, we've reached uh, the end of the presentation. So thank you uh, so far and uh, over to Meta and uh, happy to answer to all your questions. Thank you so much, um, Angela. And thank you all uh, the panelists for sharing your insights. Um, our audience, please continue sending in your questions through the chat box. Uh, we will do our best to cover as many as possible. Um, so now let's move on to the question and answers session um, and to address some few questions. So I have here a couple to get us started. Um, so the first one is uh, maybe just to get more explanation uh, in, and, and get more detail on how this uh, ALPS or the alert of price spikes data um, are used for predicting food insecurity. Um, maybe this one I hand it to Julia. Thank you so much. So the, the ALPS data is used in the predictive analytics uh, as one of the input variables for our no casting model, which, as uh, uh, Angela mentioned, is used to estimate the number of people that are food insecure. So we had to do perform a few steps in order to use the ALPS data in our predictive model. The first one was some sort of filtering. So we just didn't use all, all the data available, but uh, after some analysis and uh, uh, confrontation with the, with the expert from uh, the ECON team, we selected the ALPS related to cereals. And, and then the other step that was required to be done was uh, to what is called like feature engineering. So our model, as it was mentioned, uh, is a XGBoost model. So we need to create some sort of aggregation of our input variables. So at the moment, the, what we use is the value the minimum and the maximum value of alps in a certain area in the last three months so we had to do these two steps one kind of feature selection and feature engineering in order to to use it as one of the input variables of our model over if there is a, not a, any question on this Great. Um, maybe just a follow up. Um, there's a question from the audience uh, that um, asks um, if you, how do you like um, uh, account uh, for factors like inflation and all that in this uh, in this analysis? So I'm not sure if he's still referring to the our like machine learning model, but so for example, one of the input variable in our case is uh, also the headline and food inflation. So, so it's another input variable, but I'm not sure if it was for me the question. Great. Um, maybe let's me let's move on. And, maybe um, this. Okay. I, I think I can complement on that with the uh, related to the methodology of Alps itself, because Alps itself uh, takes into account a part of the historical inflation that was uh, experienced in a specific market. In particular, the mm, autoregressive uh, model that is uh, used to estimate the trend of the price data uh, takes uh, takes part of the inflation into account. Then it becomes really um, against the scope of ALPS itself to take too much of that inflation into account. Because in the end, the, the indicator needs to tell us when there is a spike, so a price increase, 
that is too high for the um, vulnerable, vulnerable population to deal with. Uh, so we don't want, uh, if there is a very high inflation, like the one that was experienced uh, right after COVID, let's say, so in the past years, the past year in particular, uh, we don't want to take that into account because we cannot assume that all the vulnerable households uh, will have sufficient resources to deal with that uh, inflation. So I hope this, uh, this answers your question. And then, of course, uh, we are happy to share more about the methodology on uh, how ALPS is uh, calculated. And uh, yeah, Great. It's calculated. Yeah, that would be re really useful. Uh, maybe moving on uh, to the next question. Uh, this is for Angela. So um, earlier you mentioned uh, that your team assess market functionality. While prices are um, a key variable to consider when assessing the market, there is more, more to that. So what additional dimensions do you consider? Um, how do you assess markets beyond just looking at prices? Thank you, yes. So uh, we mentioned briefly the, um, our methodology for market assessments and the market functionality index. Basically, it is um, it, this um, index relies on a um, standard questionnaire that assesses um, nine dimensions of market functionality. And um, these are, uh, for example, the assortment of essential goods that indicates, for example, which classes of, es of essential goods that could be cereals, other foods, or non-food uh, essential items can be purchased on the market, how much choice is it offered on the market. The availability dimension assesses whether the products are scarce or likely to get scarce in the short run. Then uh, um, we have the resilience of supply chain that evaluates the resp responsiveness and vulnerability of supply chains of, um, to shocks. And this is a um, regular supply of markets is key to well market, um, good market functioning. Uh, we have competition that evaluates uh, the number of traders that are active on the markets and the distribution of power among them, uh, infrastructure, uh, checking, for example, the physical infrastructure uh, structures uh, of the market, service, looking at really the uh, shopping and checkout experience, and this is often um, an indication of, again, of how well the market works, of um, an indication of transparency, of competition and reliability of the market. We also uh, look at food safety, um, so looking at hygiene, um, uh, stock um, how stocks are kept, how temperature is controlled, and then um, we look at uh, access and protection, so making sure that the same conditions are, access, are um, applied to different groups so that might access the markets. So it's a big number of dimensions that we try to summarize with then uh, in, this, in the market functionality index. And with this, we, in, like, it really helps to have a clear understanding of how the market functions uh, overall and what are the key let's say, strengths and weaknesses or what are the, the issues uh, that might affect market functionality. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. So um, we have a question from Mikael from the audience, and uh, they're asking why there are sometimes different units of measure for a single commodity in the market price data. For example, uh, some years or months, the price is reported in metric tons, and in other months, it's reported in kilograms. So is there any plan maybe for standardizing these uh, units of measure? Mm -hmm. Please okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. I, mm, indeed, in the database, we have a different unit of measures for different commodities. And for the same commodities in different countries, you might find different units of measures. This is because uh, we receive the data from various country offices and from various uh, analysis that are performed at country level. We might receive the data also from national statistical offices that collect the data with different purposes. So the market that is being assessed might be a retail market or a wholesale market. In those cases, typically, you will see a unit of measures that are uh, different then. And uh, we do not uh, um, perform transformations because uh, through this data, you can analyze the differences 
in the markup or in the uh, margin that uh, is generated or is present between the retail and the wholesale market. Uh, so converting the unit uh, directly uh, with uh, an arithmetic calculation wouldn't be correct from our perspective. We would be distorting the original information. We instead provide via our APIs, and with this probably I'm answering another of the questions that are in the, in the chat, but with our APIs, we also send conversion factors for the different unit of measures. Those conversion factors can be used then to report all the information to the same unit of measure. Um, yeah, basically this is how we deal with the unit of measures. Then of course we ask, the enumerators, uh, so our colleagues that collect the information or lead the collection of the information, to try and collect this information at the uh, unit of measure that is most used by the beneficiary themselves. So if they buy in kilograms, uh, that's the information that we should try to, to gather from, from the markets. Uh, because, of course, uh, our purpose is related to the final consumers uh, or to the potentially vulnerable populations that we are analyzing. Thank you. Thanks, Valerio. Um, so th there's another question from uh, Adrian in the, from the audience. So the question is, how representative is the sample of local markets? Um, first at the national uh, level and then uh, going down at admin one level. Um, maybe this um, one over back to you, Valeria. Okay. Uh, yes, we do have a non probabilistic sampling of markets, meaning we do not have a, a full list of all the markets in a country and we randomize which markets we collect the information from. Rather, we have three main objectives that we try to cover with the markets on which we coach, uh, with our sampling strategy, let's say. We try to observe uh, the programmatic, uh, let's say, consequences of uh, uh, market uh, price variations. We try to observe the uh, economic situation and uh, also have a ge good geographic coverage. This means that we try to observe the markets that, has, that are closest to the WFP operation to ensure that the activities that are performed by WFP or other implementing partners do not generate a negative impact on the, on the households, meaning uh, if we are distributing food or we are not distributing food, we generate inflation or deflation that damages the, the households. Uh, we mm, observe the, um, the geographic aspect because we want to have a good coverage of the markets uh, in the country from a geographic perspective. So in case that lo very localized shocks uh, hit the country, we are able to observe uh, if the evolution of prices has been also influenced by these uh, shocks. And uh, we try to observe the uh, economic aspect of the markets. So generally in a country there might be certain markets that are considered hub in, in the country uh, and from which most of the commodities pass. So in this case, in case these markets exist, we, might, we want to have the coverage of those markets so that uh, we know how prices are evolving in this very influential market. Great, Thanks. thank you, Valerio. Um, so Mindful of time, we, we need to move a little quick uh, with the questions. We have a question from Ronald uh, Santos. Um, the question uh, is more for, for HDX. Is the HDX um, the platform for a researcher to combine WFP economic analysis, earth uh, observation and conflict to conduct uh, forecasting? Um, maybe this one I can pass to Javier from Thank you, Mete, and thank you, Ronald, for your question. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the goal of XDX is to make data easy to find and use for analysis. And if you go to the platform, you will find all the uh, great data sets from WFP, but then you can combine them for analysis with other data sets related to Earth observations. So there, there are plenty of data sets related to uh, uh, flood risk, drought risk, uh, landslide risk, but also many data sets related to NDVI uh, indicators. So 
which many of them are also coming from another section within WFP, which have been very popular on the platform, and also related to conflict, there are plenty of data sets from ACLED, which is on the lead on conflict events. So feel free to, to use them for your forecast and for any analysis that you are doing. Um, hope this is useful. Back to you, Meti. Thank you. Thanks, Javier. Um, maybe back to Julia. Um, the, there's a question from Halim Jun. Um, hopefully I pronounced the name correct. Uh, how do you collect the real-time uh, hunger data? If you could share some insight into that. Yes, sure. Um, thanks for the question. So we collect uh, real-time hunger data through CATI methodology, which is a computer-assisted telephone interview. So we started about 10 years ago in WFP to collect data in this way because the standard way to collect uh, food security data was uh, through face-to-face -face assessment, but th these had some issues related to, um, of course, accessibility because uh, the majority of the people that are food insecure sometimes are um, in areas that are difficult to reach and also to timeliness because the, by the time that we collect the data, we go back, like in the field, we go back, we analyze it, and we publish it. The, the data are already updated. So for this reason, there was a need for a methodology that would allow us to have real-time data and also to reach the area that are not easily reachable uh, you know, in person. So this is done through telephone interviews mainly. Great. Thank you, Julia. Um, so there are just a couple of questions I want to run through before we, um, you know, start wrapping up. Um, so the questions are coming from Giovanni. Um, the first is, is it possible to get disaggregated survey data? And is the API available? The second is, how are the prices collected for goods that are sold in non-standard units? And the third is, how many observations per goods per market is considered a minimum in your market assessments? Um, so maybe this one, I give it to Valeria. Thank you. Thank you for these questions. Uh, uh, so the, the API is available and uh, you, are, you will be able to access the data from that API. Uh, in particular, if you look at the, um, at, at the different uh, endpoints that will be available in that API. Uh, the only point is that uh, the API is not publicly uh, discoverable, so you need to reach out to our email, and then I can share with you the, the access details of this, uh, of this API. Um, related to the unit of measures, uh, it is possible, uh, we, we do collect information also on non-standard units, and this uh, can happen in different ways. One is the, uh, typically the knowledge, uh, is localized, so the people that are conducting the assessments are trained uh, together um, and uh, are led by the, the local team. So it's uh, in that case, the knowledge is not on us, but it's on the local team to understand what is the non-standard uh, unit of measure that is being used. Or there might be cases in which uh, the numerators uh, use uh, standard scales uh, to measure the consistency of the non-standard units uh, during the, the measurement uh, exercise. Uh, meaning, yes, they go around with a, with a weight, a balance, and they actually weight the commodities that are uh, purchased. Um, and the observation, typically we recommend to have at least five observations per commodity per market. Uh, we do have a guidance on how we recommend uh, uh, to collect the market price information for food security programming that can be found in the uh, WFP Resource Center, uh, but also if you Google it, uh, probably you will find it or we can pass uh, more information if you can reach out to us. Uh, I hope I answered all your questions. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Valerio. Um, maybe just uh, the last one um, uh, in, in terms of the alert app. Um, so how, how does that alert app work? So this is a question from uh, Sarah Telford. And the question is, how does the al uh, alert app work? And can anyone sign up to get alerts? What a notification uh, software are you using? So maybe if you could okay. speak on that. Uh, so we 
We do have uh, um, a data visualization platform uh, on which you can visualize the alerts for the uh, price spikes, so how the prices are evolving, uh, but we do not send uh, uh, notifications for the alerts themselves. Typically, it's the officer that uh, uh, looks uh, into uh, the platform, uh, looks into the prices that are submitted, and that basically immediately trigger uh, the calculation uh, of the alert indicator. And then from the dashboards uh, that are inside the platform, they can in basically almost in real time, uh, almost immediately see uh, the, um, the relevant uh, alert level that is generated by uh, the platform in, in, the, in the dashboard itself. Um, it would be possible, in theory, to send an alert, but uh, for now we, we have to choose not to do so, and then we would have to, to explore which potential software we could use for, uh, uh, for doing that. Uh, it's it's a, definitely an idea. Excellent. Thank you, Valerio. Um, so since we only have a few minutes left to close this webinar, uh, I'd like to give um, you, our speakers, an opportunity to share maybe some key takeaways and in parallel uh, to gather some feedback from you, our audience. A short poll will appear uh, on your screens by um, the chat panel. Um, after you answer both questions, don't forget to click on the submit button at the bottom. So um, as our audience uh, go through those questions, maybe uh, our speakers, you each have maybe 30 seconds um, to share some key takeaways uh, or even uh, share any information on any upcoming projects, initiatives that um, you, your team specifically, or WFP more uh, broadly is working on and how can individuals, organizations, you know, get involved or stay uh, updated on, on the latest that you have. So um, back to you all, uh, maybe to, to say some few words. Maybe I can start. Um, as I, I presented the, the market monitor and we've shown you uh, a few maps and visualizations on the slides, uh, they all come from our platform that is the Economic Explorer uh, within the Data Visualized platform. Uh, I just uh, want to invite you to go there and explore more. Um, so in addition to the HDX, you can also get the, some visualizations uh, and uh, maybe see also additional details on our methodologies and on our products, uh, the updates from the market. Thank you. Maybe I'll join Angela in, in advertising another one of our products. I saw a question coming in on on hunger hotspots and food crisis where, where the situation uh, could deteriorate in the coming months or, or years. And we have a report coming out on Monday. It's the hunger hotspots report. Uh, it's a joint product with FAO and that's a comprehensive analysis of of all the of the different um, countries or places in the world where we we are worried that the situation could uh, deteriorate in the coming month and some of course are are uh, maybe expected to be there because they're in the news but um, others are big crises that are hidden and don't get um, don't always get enough attention and of course a lot of data goes into the the analysis in this report. Uh, so um, I was indeed very happy with this presentation to hear a lot of questions that are uh, quite technical and detailed on how we conduct our work and this of course uh, I'm happy the fact, uh, the fact that all this work that happens in the background to put all this information together uh, sparks uh, this interest uh, and uh, we probably will make a better work into linking this uh, knowledge and information on how the exercise is done behind the scenes uh, with the various visualization tools so that it all becomes more clear and transparent to, to you. Even if we like to receive questions, so please like uh, send them in, in case you have more. Um, and then one last reflection on the mm, other data sets that uh, um, will be coming through, uh, uh, through HDX. 
uh, for sure now that we are working and uh, consolidating the, the visualization of the uh, market assessment data, uh, we will be happy to share that information that is again uh, uh, more detailed and a bit novel because uh, we have um, to date there are no existing uh, wide market uh, assessment databases uh, that are accessible uh, to, to humanitarian organizations. Uh, so we will be happy to share that uh, and uh, together with that we are also working on making more accessible the household information, so all the, all the information that is collected through uh, household assessments uh, and maybe one of those uh, future days we can bring in the, the assessment uh, unit that is dealing with this information to, to present their work and the data that uh, uh, will become more accessible. Thanks a lot for this opportunity. Thank you. Um, so now we have come uh, to the end of this webinar. Um, hopefully at this moment, uh, our audience, you've managed to fill those two questions um, in the polls. Um, again, make sure to click on the submit button as soon as you are finished. Um, but just to close, I want to express our gratitude to our panelists, Frederick, Valerio and Angela for their valuable contributions to today's discussion. I also want to thank our audience for their engagement and questions. We hope this webinar has provided you with valuable knowledge and inspired further exploration. Before we conclude, I encourage everyone to visit the HDX platform data.humdata.org and WFP's website to explore their vast collection of data and resources. With that, we come to the end of the, uh, today's webinar. We look forward to meeting you again in our next HDX uh, dataset deep dive. Have a wonderful day. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.